So I'm going to begin, I'm going to jump ahead to chapter 2, 
opportunity to come this way. And I don't know, we'll see what we like. So we have QA at the very end, and then we have QA throughout. Let, let's see. Yeah. Right? Okay, then I'll read a I'll read a chunk and then I'll read the QA and I'll read another chunk for the QA. Can we see how that goes? Okay. Sure. Let's, let's try that. Uh, right, so I'm going to skip chapter one. Chapter one kind of sets the scene of uh, kind of the history of, of progress in technology. And the point I'm making in chapter one is that um, things are always built on top of what's come before. And the web is no different, it's no different. Then we're going to dive into uh, chapter two <coughs> material. At the risk of teaching grandmother to suck eggs, I'd like you to think about what happens when a browser parses an HTML code. Take, for example, a paragraph code with some text inside it. There's an open key tag, a closing key tag, and between those tags, there's text. A web browser, encountering this element, will display the text between the open and closing tags. Now, consider what happens when the same web browser encounters an element it doesn't recognize. Once again, the browser displays the text between the open and closing tags. What's interesting here is what the browser doesn't do. The browser does not throw an error. The browser does not stop parsing the HTML at this point, refusing to go further. Instead, it simply ignores the tags and displays the content within. This liberal attitude to errors allowed the vocabulary of HTML to grow over time from the original 21 elements to the 121 elements in HTML5. Whenever a new element is introduced to HTML, we know exactly how older browsers will treat it. They will ignore the tags and display the content. That's a remarkably powerful feature. It allows browsers to implement new HTML features at different rates. We don't have to wait for every browser to recognize a new element. Instead, we can start using the new element at any time, securing the knowledge that non-supporting browsers won't show up. If web browsers treat all tags the same way, explaining their contents, then what's the point of having a vocabulary of elements in HTML? Some HTML elements are literally meaningless. The span element says nothing about the contents within it. As far as a web browser is concerned, you may as well use a non existing mark bar element. <clears throat> but that's the exception. Most HTML elements exist for a reason. They've been created and agreed upon in order to account for specific situations that authors like you and I are likely to encounter. There are obviously special elements like the A element that come bundled with superpowers. In the case of the A element, its superpower lies in the href attribute that allows us to link out to any other resource on the web. Other elements like input, select, text area, and button have their own superpowers, allowing people to enter the data and send it to the website. Then there are the elements that describe the kind of content they contain. The contents of a key element should be considered a paragraph of text. The contents of an LI element to be considered as an item in a list. Browsers display the contents of these elements with, with some visual hints as well. You know, paragraphs are displayed with white space before and after that content. List items are displayed with bullet points and numbers before that content. The early growth of HTML vocabulary was filled with new elements that provided visual instructions to web browsers big, small, center, font. In fact, those visual instructions were the only reason those elements exist. They provided no hint as to the meaning of the content they contain. HTML is in danger of becoming a visual instruction language instead of a vocabulary of meaning. How can we and Lee, who's working at CERN at the same time as Kim Bernie Lee, we immediately recognize the potential of the world wide web and its language? He also realized that the expressive power of the language is in danger of being swapped by visual features. We proposed a new format to describe the presentation of HTML documents, cascading style sheets. 
You put the join for a Dutch programmer for a box together. They set about creating a syntax that would be powerful enough to handle the demands of designing it, while making it simple enough to learn quickly. They succeeded. Think for a moment of all the sites out there on the web. There's a huge variation in visual style, color scheme, typographic treatments, textures, and layouts. All of that variety is made possible by one simple pattern that describes all the CSS ever written. That's it. CSS shared HTML for hidden editing. If a web browser encounters a selector it doesn't understand, it simply skips over whatever is between that selector is going to place. If a browser sees a property it doesn't understand, or a value, it just ignores that particular declaration. The browser does not throw an error. The browser does not stop parsing the CSS at that point, refusing to go any further. Just as with HTML, this loose error handling has allowed CSS to grow over time. New selections, new properties, and new values have been added to the language's vocabulary over time. Whenever a new feature lands in CSS, designers and developers know that they can safely use it, even if it isn't yet widely supported in browsers. They can rest assured that old browsers will react to new features with complete indifference. Just because a language is elegant and well designed doesn't mean that people will use it. CSS arrived later than HTML. Designers didn't spend the intervening years waiting patiently for a way to style their documents on the web. They used what was available to them. In 1996, David Siegel published a book entitled Creating Killer Websites. In it, he outlined a series of ingenious techniques for rendering eye catching designs out of the raw material of HTML. One technique involved using a transparent GIF as one pixel by one pixel in size. If this was inserted into a page as an image element, but given precise values in its width and height attributes, designers could control the amount of white space in their design. Another technique used a table element. This element, along with its children, TR and TV, was intended to describe tabular data, but with the right values supplied to the widths and heights of table cells, used to recreate just about any desired layout. These were hacks, clever solutions to the problems, but they had unfortunate consequences. Designers were treating HTML as a tool for the appearance of content instead of a language for describing the meaning of content. CSS was a solution to this problem. If only designers could be convinced to use it. One of the reasons why web designers weren't using CSS was a lack of browser support. Back then, there were two major browsers competing for the soul of the web. Microsoft Explorer and Netscape Navigator. They were incompatible by design. One browser would invent a new HTML element or attribute. The other browser would invent their own separate element or attribute to do exactly the same thing. Perhaps the thinking behind this strategy is that web designers have to choose which proprietary features they are going to get behind. Like children being forced to choose between parents. In reality, web designers had little choice, but to write for both browsers, it's meant doing twice the work. Even for web designers decided enough was enough. They gathered together under the banner of the Web Standard Project, began lobbying Microsoft and Netscape to abandon their proprietary ways and adopt standards such as CSS. Time began to turn with the launch of Internet Explorer 5 to the Mac, a browser that shipped with impressive CSS support. If this was the future of web design, life was about to get a whole lot more productive and creative. Some forward thinking designers caught the CSS bug early. They redesigned their website using CSS for layout instead of using tables and spaces. True to the founding spirit of the web, they shared what they were learning and encouraged others to make a switch to CSS. Perhaps the best demonstration of the power of CSS was a website called the CSS Land Garden, created by David Schreck. It was a showcase of beautiful and varied designs, all of them accomplished with CSS. Crucially, 
the HTML remained the same. Seeing the same HTML document styled in a multitude of different ways drove home one of the beneficial effects of CSS, separation of concerns. In any system, from urban infrastructure to computer programs, the designers of that system can choose the degrees that each of the system depends on one another. In a tightly coupled system, every piece depends on every other piece. In a loosely coupled system, all the pieces are independent, with no knowledge of the other pieces. In a tightly coupled system, each part of the system can make assumptions about the other parts. These systems can be designed quite quickly, but at a price. They lack resilience. If one piece fails, you can take the whole system with it. Designing a loosely coupled system can take more work. The payoff is that the overall result is more resilient to failure. The individual parts of the system can be swapped out with a minimum of knock on effects. The hacks pioneered by David Siegel tightly coupled structure and presentation into a single monolithic developer. The adoption of CSS ease this dependency, bringing the web closer to the modular approach of the Unix philosophy. The presentational information can be moved into a separate file, the style sheet. That's how a single HTML document with CSS Zengard could have so many different files in The style sheet still needs to have some knowledge of the HTML document structure. Quite often, hooks are occurring. The markup document might decide that it wants to try seeing other style sheets. <laughs> Meanwhile, the style sheet can potentially be applied to documents. They are loosely coupled. It takes time for a discipline to develop its own design values. Web design is a young discipline indeed. While we slowly begin to form our own set of guiding principles, it's up to other disciplines for inspiration. The world of architecture has accrued its own set of design values over the years. One of these values is the principle of material honesty. One material should not be used as a substitute for another. Otherwise, the end result is deceptive. Using tables for layout is material in design. The table element is intended for not enough to respect the capital of data. The end result of using tables, font elements, and space bits is a facade. At first glance, everything looks fine, but it won't stand up to scrutiny. As soon as such a website is stress tested by actual usage across a range of browsers, the facade crumbles. Using CSS for presentation is materially honest. That's the intended use of CSS. It also allows HTML, HTML to return to fulfilling its true purpose, marking up the meaning and corners to using CSS. Instead, web designers found ways to hack around the problem, putting background images. On the element to simulate the same effect. It worked at the point, but just like a space to get had, it was a facade. Then the border radius properly arrived. Now designers can have their rounded corners in a materially honest way. <coughs> Crucially, designers were able to use new properties like border radius long before every web browser supported them. That's all thanks to the liberal era of the model success. Newer browsers were displayed around the corners. Older browsers did not fill an error. Older browsers would not stop parsing the CSS and repeat the part any further. They would simply ignore the instructions they didn't understand and move on. No harm, no foul. Of course, this means that the resulting website will look different in different browsers. Some people will see rounded corners, others won't. And that's okay. All right, so that's chapter two. Um, <laughs> so I realize that's very, 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 very basic stuff, right? I was no more fancy stuff, but I do think sometimes we kind of don't stop, you know, step back and, and realize how how vital that is, that that error handling model is in the real gift. Okay, then. <laughs> Who remembers the CSS that I'm talking about? Okay, okay. Yeah, I think without that website, CSS would have a lot of effort. I think 
Box model hack and CSS environment is probably most important thing to do with the CSS. And I'm telling you that they're pretending to publish public consciousness in the CSS environment. I think it was literally like my problem, right? Yeah. Okay, I'll move on then. That's that's uh that's a question. I'm gonna actually do chapter three right after chapter three. Design adds clarity. Using color, typography, hierarchy, contrast, and all the other tools at their disposal, designers can take an unordered jumble of information and turn it into something that's easy to use and pleasurable to control. Like life itself, design can win a small victory against the entropy of the universe, creating pockets of order from the raw materials of chaos. The Book of Kells is a beautifully illustrated manuscript created over 1,200 years ago. It's tempting to call it a work of art, but it is a work of design. The purpose of the book is to communicate a message, the Gospels of Christian religion. Through the use of illustration and calligraphy, the message is conveyed in an inviting context, making it pleasing to behold. Design works within constraints. The Columban monks who crafted the Book of Kells worked with four inks on vellum, a material of calfskin. The materials were simple, but clearly defined. Cenovitic designers knew the hues of the inks, the weight of the vellum, and crucially, they knew the dimensions of each page. Materials and processes have changed and evolved over the past millennium or so. Gutenberg's invention of movable type was a revolution in production. Whereas it would have taken just as long to create a second copy of the Book of Kells as it took to create the first, multiple copies of the Gutenberg Bible could be produced with much less labor. Even so, many of the design patterns, such as drop caps and columns, were carried over from illuminated manuscripts. The fundamental design process remained the same, knowing the width and the height of the page Designers created a pleasing arrangement of elements. The techniques of the print designer reached their zenith in the 20th century with the rise of the Swiss style. Its structured layout and clear typography is exemplified in the work of designers like Josef Müller Bachmann and Jan Schicko. They formulated grid systems and typographic scales based on the preceding centuries of design. Knowing the ratio of the dimensions of a page, designers can position elements with maximum effect. The page is a constraint, and the grid system is a way of imposing order on it. When the web began to conquer the world in the 1990s, designers started migrating from paper to pixels. David Siegel's Creating Killer websites came along at just the right time. It's clever table and gift packs allowed designers to replicate the same kind of layouts that they had previously created for the printed page. Those table layouts later became CSS layouts, but the fundamental thinking remained the same. The browser window, like the page before it, was treated as a known constraint upon which designers imposed order. There's a problem with this approach. Whereas a piece of paper or vellum has a fixed ratio, a browser window could be any size. There's no way for a web designer to know in advance what size any particular person's browser window would be. Designers had grown accustomed to knowing the dimensions of the rectangles they were designing for. The web removed that constraint. There's nothing quite as frightening as the unknown. These words of former U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld should be truly <laughs> terrifying, though the general consensus at the time sounded like nonsense. Quote, there are no knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. <laughs> 
The ratio of the browser window is just one example of a known unknown on the web. The simplest way to deal with this situation is to use flexible units for layout, percentages rather than pixels. Instead, designers chose to pretend that the browser dimensions were a known known. They created fixed width layouts for one specific window size. In the early days of the web, most monitors were 640 pixels wide. Web designers created layouts that were 640 pixels wide. As more and more people began using monitors that were 800 pixels wide, more and more designers began creating 800 pixel wide layouts. A few years later, that became 1,024 pixels. At some point, web designers settled on the magic number of 960 pixels as the ideal width. It was as though the web design community were participating in a shared consensual illumination. Not everyone went along with this web wide memo. In the year 2000, the online magazine A List of Heart published an article entitled A Dow of Web Design. It has stood the test of time remarkably well. In the article, John Alsop points out that new mediums often start out by taking on the tropes of a previous medium. Scott McLeod makes the same point in his book Understanding Comics. Quote, each new medium begins its life by imitating its predecessors. Many early movies were like filmed stage plays. Much early television was like radio with pictures or reduced movies. End quote. With that in mind, it's hardly surprising that web design began with attempts to recreate the kinds of layouts that designers were familiar with from the print world. As John put it, quote, killer websites are usually those which tame the wildness of the web, constraining pages as if they were made of paper. Desktop publishing for the web, end quote. Web design can benefit from the centuries of learning that have informed print design. Massimo Vignelli, whose work epitomizes the Swiss style, begins his famous canon with a list of the intangibles, including discipline, appropriateness, timelessness, responsibility, and more. Everything in that list can be applied to designing for the web. Vignelli's canon also includes a list of the tangibles. That list begins with paper sizes. The web is not print. The known constraints of paper, its width and its height, simply don't exist. The web is bound by preset dimensions. John Alsop's A Dow of Web Design called on practitioners to acknowledge this. Quote, the control which designers know in the print medium and often desire in the web medium is simply a function of the limitation of the printed page. We should embrace the fact that the web doesn't have the same constraints and design for this flexibility, end quote. This call to arms went unheeded. Designers remained in their matrix-like consensual hallucination. Everyone's browser was the same width. That's understandable. There's a great comfort to be had in believing a reassuring fiction, especially when it confers the illusion of control. There's another reason why web designers clung to the comfort of their fixed width layouts. The tools of the trade encourage a paper like approach to designing for the web. It's a poor craft person who always blames their tools, and yet every craft person is influenced by their choice of tools. As Marshall McLuhan, uh, Marshall McLuhan's colleague, Tom Culkin, put it we shape our tools, and thereafter, our tools shape us. When the discipline of web design was emerging, there was no software created specifically for visualizing layouts on the web. Instead, designers co-opted existing tools. Adobe Photoshop, photos, applying filters, compositing layers, and so on. By the mid-90s, it had become an indispensable tool for graphic designers. When those same designers began designing for the web, they continued using the software they were already familiar with. If you've ever used Photoshop, then you know what happens when you select New from the file menu. You will be asked to enter fixed dimensions for the canvas you are about to work with. Before adding a single pixel, a fundamental design decision has been made 
that reinforces the consensual hallucination of an inflexible life. Photoshop alone can't take the blame for fixed limitations. After all, it was never intended for designing web pages. Eventually, software was released with the specific goal of creating web pages. Macromedia's Dreamweaver was an early example of a web design tool. Unfortunately, it operated according to the idea of the WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. While it's true that when designing the Dreamweaver, what you see is what you get, on the web, there is no guarantee that what you see is what everyone else will get. Once again, web designers were encouraged to embrace the illusion of control rather than face the inherent uncertainty of their media. It's possible to overcome the built-in biases of tools like Photoshop and Dreamweaver, but it isn't easy. We might like to think that we are in control of our tools, that we bend them to our will, but the truth is, that all software is opinion of software. As futurist Jaime Castillo put it, software, like all technologies, is inherently political. The code inevitably reflects the choices, biases, and desires of its creators. Small wonder then that designers working with the grain of their tools produce websites that mirror the assumptions baked into those tools. Assumptions around the ability to control and contain the known unknowns of the World Wide Web. By the middle of the first decade of the 21st century, the field of web design was propped up by multiple assumptions. That everyone was browsing with a screen large enough to view a 960 pixel wide layout. That everyone had broadband internet access, mitigating the need to optimize the number and file size of images on web pages. That everyone was using a modern web browser with the latest plugins installed. A minority of web designers were still pleading for fluid layouts. I counted myself among their number. We were tolerated in much the same manner as a prophet of doom on the street corner wearing a sandwich board reading, the end is nigh, inconvenient but harmless distraction. There are even designers suggesting that Photoshop might not be the best tool for the web and that we could consider designing directly in the browser using CSS and HTML. That approach was criticized as being too constraining. As we've seen, Photoshop has its own constraints, but those have been internalized by designers so comfortable in using the tool that they no longer recognize its shortcomings. This debate around the merits of designing Photoshop comps, designing in the browser, would have remained largely academic. If it weren't for an event that would shake up the world of web design forever. Quote, an iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone, are you getting it yet? <laughs> These are not three separate devices. This is one device, and we are calling it iPhone. End quote. With those words in 2007, Steve Jobs unveiled a mobile device that would be used to browse the World Wide Web. Web-capable mobile devices existed before the iPhone, but they were mostly limited to displaying a specialized mobile-friendly file format called WML. Very few devices could render HTML. With the introduction of the iPhone and its competitors, handheld devices were shipping with modern web browsers capable of being first-class citizens on the web. This threw the field of web design into turmoil. Assumptions that had formed the basis for an entire industry were now being called into question. How do we know if people are using wide desktop screens or narrow handheld screens? How do we know if people are browsing with a fast broadband connection at home or with a slow mobile network? How do we know if a device even supports a particular technology or plugin? The rise of mobile devices was confronting web designers with the true nature of the web as a flexible media with unknowns. The initial reaction to this newly exposed reality involves segmentation. Rather than rethink the existing desktop-optimized website, what if mobile devices can be shunted off to a separate silo? This mobile ghetto is often a separate subdomain to the real website, uh, m.example.com or mobile.example. This segmented approach was bolstered by the use of the term, the 
the mobile web, instead of the more accurate term, the web as experienced on mobile. In the tradition of their earlier consensual hallucinations, web designers were thinking of mobile and desktop not just as separate classes of device, but as entirely separate websites. Determining which devices were sent to which subdomain required checking the browser's user rating strength against an ever-expanding list of known browsers. It was a Red Queen's arms race just to stay up to date. As well as being error-prone, it was also fairly arbitrary. While it might have been once been fairly easy to classify, say, an iPhone as a mobile device, that distinction grew more difficult over time. With the introduction of tablets such as the iPad, it was no longer clear which devices should be redirected to the mobile URL. Perhaps a new subdomain was called for, t.example.com or tablet.example.com, along with a new term like the tablet web. But what about the TV web or the internet-enabled fridge web? <laughs> the practice of creating different sites for different devices just didn't scale. It also ran counter to a long-held ideal called one web. Quote, one web means making, as far as infeasible, the same information and services available to users, irrespective of the device they are using, end quote. This does not mean that small screen devices should be served in page layouts and designed for larger dimensions. Quote, however, it does not mean that exactly the same information is available in exactly the same representation across all devices, end quote. If web designers wish to remain true to the spirit of one web, they needed to provide the same core content at the same URL to everyone, regardless of their device. At the same time, they needed to be able to create different layouts depending on the screen real estate available. The shared illusion of a one-size-fits-all approach to web design began to evaporate. It was gradually replaced by an acceptance of the ever-changing, fluid nature of the web. At this point, I have to apologize in advance to Ethan, because it's not going to be in April of 2010, Ethan Mark stood on stage at the Venture Park in Seattle, a gathering for people who make websites. He spoke about an interesting school of thought in the world of architecture, responsive design. The idea that buildings could change and adapt according to the needs of the people using the building. This, he explained, could be a way to approach making websites. One month later, he expanded on this idea in an article called Responsive Web Design. It was published on a list of art, the same website that had published John Alsop's A Dow of Web Design 10 years earlier. Ethan's article shared the same spirit as John's earlier rallying cry. In fact, Ethan begins his article by referencing A Dow of Web Design. Both articles called on web designers to embrace the idea of one web. Whereas a DAO of web design was largely rejected by designers comfortable with their WYSIWYG tools, responsive web design found an audience of designers desperate to resolve the mobile conundrum. Writer Stephen Johnson has documented the history of invention and innovation. In his book, Where Good Ideas Come From, he explores an idea called the adjacent possible. Quote, at every moment in the timeline of an expanding biosphere, there are doors that cannot be unlocked yet. In human culture, we like to think of breakthrough ideas as sudden accelerations of the timeline, where a genius jumps ahead 50 years and invents something that normal minds trapped in the present moment couldn't possibly have come up with. But the truth is that technological and scientific advances rarely break out of the adjacent possible. The history of cultural progress is almost without exception a story of one door leading to another door exploring the palace one room at a time, end quote. This is why the microwave oven could not have been invented in medieval France. There are too many preceding steps required, manufacturing, energy, theory, to make that kind of leap. Facebook could not exist without the World Wide Web, which could not exist without the internet, which could not exist without computers, and so on. Each step depends upon the accumulated layers below. By the time Ethan coined the term responsive web design, a number of technological advances had fallen into place. As I wrote in the foreword to Ethan's subsequent book on the topic, quote, the technologies existed already. 
fluid grids, flexible images, and media queries. But Ethan united these techniques under a single banner, and in doing so, changed the way we think about web design, end quote. One, fluid grids. The option to use percentages instead of pixels has been with us since the days of table layout. Two, flexible images. Research carried out by Richard Rutter showed that browsers were becoming increasingly adept at resizing images. The intrinsic dimensions of an image need not be a limiting factor. Three, media queries. Thanks to the error handling model of CSS, browsers have been adding feature upon feature over time. One of these features was CSS media queries, the ability to define styles according to certain parameters, such as the dimensions of the browser window. The layers were in place. A desire for change, driven by the relentless rise of mobile, was also in place. What was needed was a slogan under which these could be united, and that's what Ethan gave us with responsive web design. The first experiments in responsive design involved retrofitting existing desktop-centric websites, converting pixels to percentages, and adding media queries to remove the grid layout on smaller screens. But this reactive approach to provide a firm foundation to build upon. Fortunately, another slogan was able to encapsulate a more resilient approach. Luke Rubiuski coined the term mobile first in response to the ascendancy of mobile devices. Quote, losing 80% of your screen space forces you to focus. You need to make sure that what stays on the screen is the most important set of features for your customers and your business. There simply isn't room for any interface debris or content of questionable value. You need to know what matters most. End quote. If you can prioritize your content and make it work within the confined space of a small screen, then you will have created a robust, resilient design that you can build upon for larger screen sizes. Stephanie and Brian Rieger encapsulated the mobile first responsive design approach. Quote, the lack of a media query is your first media query, end quote. In this context, mobile first is less about mobile devices per se, and instead focuses on prioritizing content and tasks regardless of the device. It discourages assumptions. In the past, web designers have fallen afoul of unfounded assumptions about desktop devices. Now it was equally important to avoid making assumptions about mobile devices. Web designers could no longer make assumptions about screen sizes, bandwidth, or browser capabilities. They were left with the one aspect of the website that was genuinely under their control, the content. Echoing a DAO of web design, designer Mark Bolton put this new approach into a historical context. Quote, embrace the fluidity of the web. Design layouts and systems that can cope to whatever environment they may find themselves in. But the only way we can do any of this is to shed ways of thinking that have been shackles around our necks. They're holding us back. Start designing from the content out rather than from the canvas in. End quote. This content out way of thinking is fundamentally different to the canvas in approach that dates all the way back to the Book of Kells. It asks web designers to give up the illusion of control and create a materially honest discipline for the World Wide Web. Relinquishing control does not mean relinquishing quality, quite the opposite. In acknowledging the many unknowns involved in designing for the web, designers can craft in a resilient, flexible way that is true to the media. Texan web designer Trent Walton was initially wary of responsive design, but soon realized that it was a more honest, authentic approach in creating fixed width Photoshop mockups. Quote, my love for responsive centers around the idea that my website will meet you wherever you are, from mobile to full-blown desktop, and anywhere in between, end quote. For years, web design was dictated by the designer. The user had no choice but to accommodate the site's demands for a screen of a certain size or a network connection of a certain speed. Now, web design can be a conversation between the designer and the user. Now, web design can reflect the underlying principles of the web itself. 
on the 20th anniversary of the World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee wrote an article for Scientific American in which he reiterated those underlying principles. Quote, the primary design principle underlying the web's usefulness and growth is universality. The web should be usable by people with disabilities. It must work with any form of information, be it a document or a point of data, and information of any quality from a silly tweet to a scholarly paper. And it should be accessible from any kind of hardware that can connect to the internet, stationary or mobile, small screen or large. End quote. So that's the end of that chapter. So yeah, it turned out, uh, when I was writing this, I didn't intend it to become a, a history lesson, but as it went on, that's kind of what it became. I found myself going back further and further in time, and just sort of documenting these steps. Um, any questions on, on that? You're a shy bunch. Ethan, yes. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Ethan. Um, I really enjoyed what you were saying about segmentation and what we were sort of seeing at the individual site level, you know, sort of partitioning experiences in the device specific sites. Yeah. Um, I guess fast forwarding to now, um, with Facebook and some articles, Google AMP, um, and you know, sort of contrasting some of the segmentation we might be seeing from the platform level. Can you talk a little bit about how you feel about the health of one web these days? Yeah, so it's so hmm, it's tricky. Because on the one hand, um, we as a community are partially the web's not a great experience, particularly on mobile devices, um, and a lot of that is because of you know, megabytes of JavaScript or giant images and all that kind of stuff. Well, to be fair, it's rarely us adding those megabytes of JavaScript to you know, add buttons that inject it. Um, so the idea that you know something must be done, I kind of get it, um, but it, it is it is also an attack vector on the web. Say that we'll you know we'll create a beautiful experience. Just come on over here, um, but you have to give up the webbiness of the web. URLs, for example. So things like Facebook and articles, you view them on Facebook. You don't go out to the website. Um, initially, Google AMP, I thought wasn't going to work that way. The, the, the promise of it was it's on your website. You create the AMP page. But then it turned out the only way that you got the benefits of that was if it was served from Google. They created a copy and served. Um, so kind of same problem. And it's never reaching the end of the So in a weird way, we're turning to the, the sort of um, walled gardens that we had at the birth of the web. When the web came along, you know, it's messy, chaotic places. It's, it's a total mess. There were much um, tamer places like uh, CompuServe, AOL, where it was like, it was almost like, oh, don't go out there into the wild west of the web. You know, stay here. It's nice and safe, and you've got all these lovely content. For you. I do not really warn you. Follow the link out to the web. Um, Facebook does the same thing today. Right? It's like, ooh, are you sure you want to leave Facebook? <laughs> it's safe in here. Uh, it's kind of weird, actually. It's we, we, you know, because the wall gardens lost out to the, the web. It turned out people wanted the wild places of the web. And yet we ended up returning it to wall gardens of our own choice. The weird thing is that the wall gardens in the past used to produce nice content for us. Like, we had a lot of content. Now we create the content for the wall gardens. It's like we create Facebook and Instagram. We create that thing. It's like the biggest media companies in the world don't create any media. They do it for them. Um, there is an interesting challenge because let, let's suppose, you know, on an objective level, AMP is a better experience. Facebook and Instagram is a better experience. Apple News is a better experience. Then, you know, according to the principles of good user experience design, that's what we should go with. Experience is what we talked about. Um, I'm not so sure because I think openness, a certain level of freedom, can trump even uh, convenience. So, and I know designers who have said that I don't care what the platforms I'm designing for, as long as the experience is good. And they go between web and native and things at, at ease, right? And I'm not like that because as soon as I step out of the web, I'm like, what's the point? Like, it's not a URL that can be shared, I just don't get it. And yet I realized maybe the experience is better than a you know, more constrained, more controlled platform. But I do think that there's, there's kind of a long-term thing to think about. Like you, when you're about to make any decision, you have ethical questions. Like, well, what if everybody was doing that? If 
everybody would switch to smartphones or not, then there wouldn't be web anymore. Um, it's kind of a, a scary thought. So I sometimes I'm willing to, to know, let's take the long, hard way of solving these problems, like uploaded images, images are too big, and all this stuff. But let's, let's solve it on the open web rather than giving up and going into the silos again. Um, I'm, yeah, not often alone in that. But it certainly feels that way sometimes, like you're crying in the wilderness. Yeah. Oh, question back here. Yeah. Um, I know, I haven't been doing this for a while, but the last time I looked, it really, I mean, it, you were using pixel, number of pixels as a, um, a substitute for what you really want to know, which is what is the angular size of the screen? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we kind of, so there's a danger. We, we can use media queries to know what is the width of the browser and the height of the browser. And to use that for just layout seems reasonable. Um, because we know like if the browser window is 300 pixels and wide, let's not have a layout that's any greater than 300 pixels. That's reasonable. Where it gets tricky is if you start to make inferences based on that. So to ah, the width of this browser window is 320 pixels. Therefore, I infer it's a mobile device. Therefore, the person isn't interested in getting the full content and they just want a quick summary. And therefore, the person must be on a really slow connection, it couldn't possibly just be sitting at home on the sofa and all that place, right? So I think the danger is, again, uh, inferences and assumptions. It always comes back to assumptions. The problem was there is no way to tell what well, let's say, yeah. uh, with, uh, let's say, distance from the device would be enormously useful for that, right? Uh, if we knew how far away the user was. I don't know the angle of the yeah, it has gotten easier to do flexible layouts that fit within the angles of kind of you know, with, with units like viewport, with viewport, right? That does kind of allow us to, I don't want to say it gets us back to the page and no dimensions, but at least allows us to do ratio based designs, um, which is kind of interesting. I don't know. I'm not saying the fold is back, but uh, it's not quite dead yet. Yeah, so I think the danger is when you try to infer something. Uh, not just about the device, but about the user's situation based on something as... So, so I guess the question is why isn't there the ability to get like the... The ratio that the... the ratio yeah. the angle, the angle, I, if I know the pixel width of that and I know the angle of that's intense the eye, then I can really do something. Ooh, well, what, would you, what would you assume based on that? I assume that people are seeing that that's what they're seeing, right? So, well, with viewport units, who does? I mean, you can say, I want something to take up a certain proportion of the height of the viewport. Thank you. I also believe the ratio, like screen ratio, frames are a little more on it. So, but I'm almost a bit wary of us getting too much information that we can buy. It's how we nail it. It feels like, again, we're trying to lock things down, I'm trying to constrain things. I mean, I shouldn't have much of a difference between looking at, at a screen that's, that's that big. If I, if I know how far away, right, if I know how far away, which is the same thing as the you know, uh, viewing it. But yeah, well, we don't know that, so you can't make an What I'm saying is you could know that, right? We could know how far away a person is. No, but you can ask for access to the video camera, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Someone has actually done that as an experiment. In fact, the type gets bigger and smaller as you get closer and closer. Do you have a question on your hand? Yeah. Uh, Jack, uh, indeed, I want to make a comment uh, to your previous question. Uh, uh, to some extent, uh, we can know what the device the users are, uh, which is uh, to our uh, page loading. We listen to, uh, we, we find the uh, window in the height and the window in the side. Uh, to be in the middle in the west and the and, and the media and the media scene. Then uh, with this screen we can add a pass to a body or a, a container depth and uh, we can just uh, uh, just uh, then we can set up a different uh, decorations. Yes, you can do that in JavaScript after the document has arrived in the browser. Yeah. At that point it's kind of a bit late. So unless you're deciding I'm just gonna do everything in JavaScript. I got two problems. No. We, we can add a class 
一开的 class 会带我多带一个呃多呃多的 small screen at dinner party or 多的 large screen at dinner party or but only after the particular concert. But we have made several different CSS with the well with the different uh different mobile and tablet yeah desktop yeah. And those are the only three sizes out there. And not not only three. But point yeah, is, yeah. again, we're trying to constrain. Why not just embrace the fact that it's flexible? It's a it's a continuum. It isn't something that you can put into buckets. Of, it's a class of mobile or a class of tablet or a yeah. class of desktop. Yeah. It's flexible. Yeah. And even though you're right, once once the payload has been delivered from the yeah. server to the client, we can use JavaScript to measure yeah. exactly. We could even get the dimensions, the ratio, and all that kind of stuff. But it's a bit late at that point. Yeah. Right. At that point, you've already sent the payload yeah. to the server. Uh, another question is that uh, we have different interactions between the uh, between the uh, between the uh, yeah, between, uh, between, uh, between uh, our last screen, uh, our laptop, and the between uh, and the uh, uh, and the uh, uh, phone. For example, the mentions in a in a laptop we often have a pop up window, but in the phone the mentions is something pop up from uh, from the bottom. So should we still uh, so how can we uh, consider the two different interactions between different interfaces? Don't pop up anything. Why why do you think that's okay? So like, oh first of all, that's not, I'm totally gonna throw a pop someone gonna slide something in front of them when they try to accomplish the task. Don't do that. <laughs> now it's like you know, talk to a person when I do this. <laughs> we don't have to have those yeah. interactions. Yeah. And also, I'm not trying to chew that this again that you could categorize interactions by device type. You might think, oh well, the mobile phone it's all about touch, right? And on the desktop it's about mouse control. But now you know you look at Microsoft Surface yeah. and other devices it's touch and the keyboard. You can tether your phone to you know. Screens and so you can't really make any assumptions about interaction, size, any of that kind of stuff, and that's good. Yeah, and it is interesting. Oh, then we keep wanting to, we want known knowns, we want to act as a level. I knowing this piece of knowledge, I can therefore safely, confidently make this assumption, yeah. and you can't. And then, anyway, something will come along in three months' time that will blow that assumption out of the water, right? We'll have different kinds of interaction, different kinds of screen sizes, yeah. so. Thinking of the future, not just where you want to be. You don't want to be just looking in the rear view mirror. Yeah. Um, you want to be planning for the future as well. Oh, well just a good question. Back to you. Um, kind of related to all that. What about the argument about how you know, when you're on a smaller device and you're intentionally reducing the amount of content on the page to make it a better experience? Wait, wait, wait. About reducing it from what? Well, just in terms of like the layout and like making it. Where did it? What's the starting point there? What could you reduce it from? Well, from whatever the desktop is used to. Ah, see, that's. <laughs> but the argument is like having, if, if you create a truly responsive design for your site so that it works on any screen, for the smaller screen, you're having to download all that extra information to render the. Only the if your starting point is the assumption of a desktop size and the exception being mobile. Turn that on its head. Make the assumption. The small screen and the exception the large screen. In that situation, what you do is you send the, the core content to everyone, all of that Then, using JavaScript, for instance, say, okay, let's test the uh, size of this window. Oh, I've got loads of space to play with. And then request some extra information and add it. So you've got to switch your mindset around. You're not shrinking down from the larger display. That's not the larger display is the default. The whole point of mobile first is. The smaller display is the default. The larger display is the exception. In fact, now with browsing stats, that's literally true. Mobile is the default. The desktop is the exception. So we need to treat it that way. Again, a lot of this comes back to the design process. When we open up our, and you know, we switched over to Sketch or InVision, whatever it is these days. But still, it tends to be we design on the bigger canvas, and ah, shit, I design the smaller screen. Right? <laughs> and we make three art boards. <laughs> 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 Even in that situation, start with the assumption that the smaller one is the default. And then when you get to the bigger screen, it's like getting a bonus. It's like, oh, boy, I've got a playground now. What can I put into this extra space? And that's a much easier question to answer than, 
oh shit, what do I do? Move, mm -hmm. right? So the mobile first approach forces you to prioritize your content first. Instead of starting like, oh, I'm not gonna think about it now, right? I'm just gonna do it bigger than, at the end, you know, okay, shit, how am I gonna make this fit on a small screen? This is hard, what do I take away? So it's, it's a change of mindset. That's sort of, it's reflected in our tools, it's reflected in our processes, um, you know, even things like if you're working an agency sign-off, you know, typically she showed a nice big design to the client. Like, what do you think? You like it? And what we should be doing is showing just literally the content you know, without any layout, just one column. Right? Okay, this is our starting point. Sign off and then take it from there. Truly mobile first. Good question. Yeah, I don't know. This was somewhat covered by that last point, but the question I was going to ask is. To, to talk a little bit about columns, number of columns. If you had high definition screen, you might want to use four columns. Uh, and I, I don't know if you if you kind of covered that topic just now or not. But if, just in general, how do you think about columns? Number of columns. You're playing with? Um, well, I think it's one of the really interesting things about the web because previous mediums like paper, you know, you divide it up generally according to the ratio width and height. You know, the web you don't. We know that, although we're getting, you know, the few fortunes we're getting there. What we do know is we can, you know, we, we get smaller screens, wider screens. So having a layout that's flexible and can adapt, and have sometimes this many columns, sometimes that many columns, um, is really useful. And we're there now with CSS Grid. With CSS Grid, you can do things like, uh, you know, there's that really short rule with like um, new content, auto fit, auto fit, yeah, auto fill, auto fit. It's magic. You can write one line of CSS and say, I want as many columns as work. Say to the browser, you figure it out. Right? It's very <laughs> different for us trying to constrain and, and have to dictate precisely. It's like, okay, these are the parameters, and I want you to effectively come up with the best layout for the current viewport size without me having to do the work. But it, we haven't had that for most of the web's history. But for the longest time, CSS was deliberately not a layout language. I mean, it was in the specs, and CSS is not for a layout. Um, so presentation, not layout. We were happy to have clothes, right? But now with grid, we can we can have something that's native to the flexible nature of grid. With stuff like auto fit and auto fill, min content, max content. That those are so wedding, right? That only really works on, on a flexible, on a flexible medium. Um, so we're there now, but for the longest time it's hard. And that's probably why people reached for 960 pixels. Everything is 12 columns. Again, it was a conceptual hallucination, but it was easier to do. And now we have the tools, so we can do it. I have a suggestion. You, you're quite good when people ask you questions. Notice it, it, it's enjoyable. Uh, is there, I mean, people might have more questions. My, my other thought is is there any high level comments that you want to make about some of the other chapters rather than reading them? No, I'd rather be. <laughs> <laughs> that was the longest chapter. I think what I'm hearing is that was boring. But um, no <laughs> well, it's, it's, I'm going to wrap up with a short one. You me? a beautiful voice. <laughs> if you will indulge me. Oh, no. um, I'm going to skip over chapter four, which is about the languages of the web, because that gets much more into JavaScript. It's also probably the most contentious chapter, so you might want to read that one. Um, and skip to chapter five. This will be the last one I read, so don't worry. Um, which really gets to the heart of kind of what I'm talking about in this book. In fact, every time I give a complex talk, um, this uh, approach to, to the web, kind of what we were saying there about you know, whether it's coming at it in a reductive way, taking things out, or whether it's an accumulation, of it. kind of how I think about it, with layers. Um, so, if you have more questions at the end, this is a much shorter chapter, don't worry. Um, but I'll, I'll wrap it up with this one. That sound okay? All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Layers. In his classic book, How Buildings Learn, Stuart Brand highlights an idea by the British architect Frank Duffy. Quote, a building properly conceived is several layers of longevity. End quote. Duffy called these shearing layers. Each of the layers moves at a different time scale. Brand expanded on the idea, proposing six alliterative layers. One, site. The physical location of a building only changes on a geological time scale. 
Two, structure. The building itself can last for centuries. Three, skin. The exterior surface gets a facelift or a new lid of paint every few decades. Four, services. The plumbing and wiring need to be updated every 10 years or so. Five, space plan. The layout of walls and doors might change occasionally. Six, stuff. The arrangement of furniture in the room can change on a daily basis. The idea of shearing layers can also be applied to our creations on the web. Our domain names are the geological sites on which we build. At the other end of the time scale, content on the web, the stuff, can be added and updated by the hour, the minute, or even the second. In between are the layers of structure, presentation, and behavior. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Those layers can be loosely coupled, but they aren't completely independent. Just as a building cannot have furniture without first having rooms and walls, a style sheet needs some markup to act upon. The coupling between structure and presentation is handled through selectors in CSS. Element selectors, class selectors, and so on. With JavaScript, the coupling is handled through the vocabulary of the document object model. In a later book, The Clock of the Long Now, Stuart Brand applied the idea of shearing layers, or paste layers, to civilization itself. The slowest moving layer is nature, then there's culture, followed by governance, then infrastructure, and finally commerce and fashion. In a loosely coupled way, each layer depends on the layer below. In turn, the accumulation of each successive layer enables an adjacent possible filled with more opportunities. Likewise, the expressiveness of CSS and JavaScript is only made possible on a foundation of HTML, which itself requires a URL to be reachable, which in turn depends on the hypertext transfer protocol, which sits atop the bedrock of TCP IP. Each of the web's shearing layers can be peeled back to reveal the layer below. Running that process in reverse, applying each layer in turn, is a key principle of resilient web design. In 2003, at the South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas, primarily an event for musicians and filmmakers, today the music and film portions are eclipsed by the juggernaut of South by Southwest Interactive, dedicated to all things digital. In 2003, South by Southwest Interactive was a small affair, squeezed into one corner of one floor of the Austin Convention Center. It was a chance for a few web designers and bloggers to get together and share ideas. That year, Steve Champion and Nick Fink presented a talk entitled Inclusive Web Design for the Future with Progressive Enhancement. It opened with this call to arms. Quote, web design must mature and accept the developments of the past several years, abandon the exclusionary attitudes formed in the rough and tumble dot com era, realize the coming future of a wide variety of devices and platforms, and separate semantic markup from presentation, logic, and behavior. End quote. Like Tim Berners-Lee, Stephen Champion had experience of working with SGML, the markup language that would so heavily influence HTML. In dealing with documents that needed to be repurposed for different outputs, came to value the separation of structure from presentation. A meaningfully marked up document can be presented in multiple ways through the addition of CSS and JavaScript. This layered approach to the web allows the same content to be served up to a wide variety of people. But this doesn't mean that everyone gets the same experience. Champion realized that a strong separation of concerns would allow enhancements to be applied according to the capabilities of the end user's device. To paraphrase Karl Marx, progressive enhancement allows designers to ask for each browser according to its ability and to deliver to each device according to its needs. Some web designers were concerned that progressive enhancement would be a creative straitjacket. Designing for the lowest common denominator did not sound like a recipe for progress. But this was a misunderstanding. Progressive enhancement asks that designers start from the lowest common denominator, the one marked up document. But there is no limit to where they can go from there. In fact, 
It's the very presence of a solid baseline of HTML that allows web designers to experiment with the latest and greatest CSS. Thanks to Costello's law and the loose error handling model of CSS, the designers are free to apply styles that only work in the newest browsers. This means that not everyone will experience the same visual design. This is not a bug. This is a feature of the web. New browsers and old browsers, monochrome displays and multicolored displays, fast connections and slow connections, big screens, small screens, and no screens, everyone can access your content. That content should look different in such varied situations. If a website looks the same on a 10-year-old browser as it does in the newest devices, then it probably isn't taking advantage of the great flexibility that the web offers. To emphasize this, designer Dan Cedarholm created a website to answer the question, do websites need to look exactly the same in every browser? You can find the answer to that question at the URL, do websites need to look exactly the same in every browser.com? <laughs> <laughs> at the risk of spoiling the surprise for you, the answer is in the no. If you visit that website, you will see that answer proudly displayed. But depending on the capabilities of your browser, you may or may not see some of the stylistic flourishes applied to that single word. <laughs> Even if you don't get any of the styles, you'll still get the content marked up with semantic HTML. Separating structure and presentation is relatively straightforward. You can declare whatever styles you want, safe from the knowledge that browsers will know what they don't understand. Separating structure and behavior isn't quite so easy. If you give a browser some JavaScript that it doesn't understand, not only will it not apply the desired behavior, it will refuse to parse the rest of the JavaScript. Before you would use a particular feature in JavaScript, it's worth testing to see if that feature is supported. This kind of feature detection can save your website visitors from having a broken experience because of an unsupported feature. If you want to use Ajax, check first that the browser supports the object you're about to use to enable that Ajax functionality. If you want to use the geolocation API, check first that the browser supports it. A team of web developers working at the BBC News website refer to this kind of feature detection as cutting the mustard. Browsers that cut the mustard get an enhanced experience. Browsers that don't cut the mustard still get access to the content, but without the JavaScript messages. Feature detection, cutting the mustard, whatever you want to call it, is a fairly straightforward technique. Uh, let's say you want to traverse the DOM using query selector and attach events to some nodes in the document using add event listener. Your mustard cutting logic might look something like this. There are two points to note here. One, this is feature detection, not browser detection. Instead of asking, which browser are you? I'm trying to infer feature support from the answer. It is safer to simply ask, do you support this feature? Two, there is no else statement. Back when web designers were trying to exert print-like control over web browsers, a successful design was measured in pixel perfection. Did the website look exactly the same in every browser? Unless every browser supported a particular feature, like say rounded corners in CSS, then that feature was off the table. Instead, designers would fake it with extra markup of images. The resulting websites lacked structural honesty. Not only was this a waste of talent and energy on the part of the designers, it was a waste of the capabilities of modern web browsers. The rise of mobiles, tablets, and responsive design helped to loosen this restrictive mindset. It is no longer realistic to expect pixel-perfect parity across devices and browsers, but you'll still find web designers bemoaning the fact that they have to support an older, outdated browser because a portion of their audience is still using it. They're absolutely right. Anyone using that browser should have access to the same content as somebody using the latest and greatest web browser. But that doesn't mean they should get the same experience. As Brad Frost puts it, quote, there's a difference between support and optimization, end quote. Support every browser, 
but optimized for none. Some designers misunderstood progressive enhancement to mean that all functionality must be provided to everyone. It's the opposite. Progressive enhancement means providing core functionality to everyone. After that, it's every browser for itself. Far from restricting what features you can use, progressive enhancement provides web designers with a way to safely use the latest and greatest features without worrying about older browsers. Scott Gell of the Agency Filament Group puts it succinctly, quote, progressive enhancement frees us to focus on the costs of building features for modern browsers without worrying much about leaving anyone out. With a strongly qualified code base, older browser support comes nearly for free, end quote. If a website is built using progressive enhancement, then it's okay if a particular feature isn't supported or fails to load. Ajax, geolocation, whatever. As long as the core functionality is still available, web designers don't need to bend over backwards trying to crowbar support for newer features into older browsers. You also get a website that's more resilient to JavaScript's error handling model. Matt Marquis worked alongside Scott Gell on the responsive website for the Boston Globe. He noted, quote, lots of cool features on the Boston Globe don't work when JavaScript breaks. Reading the news is not one of them. <laughs> the trick is identifying what is considered core functionality and what is considered an enhancement. All right, thank you very much. Um, I really like the, the idea of polyfill in that it's um, kind of time-sensitive band-aid that you add to a, a, a site. And that you don't try to create a new way of describing something. You use a standard that just isn't implemented very well yet. And then as the standard gets implemented more and more in time, you take the polyfill out. Um, picture fill from film group, classic example. Um, yeah, that's just really good. I mean, I would say that the uh, auto prefix are it's kind of a polyfill that you can probably throw away now. That's uh, it's kind of done its job. If you go through the code base and see how many prefixes are actually added, at this point, it's probably not many. So I, I'm kind of in favor, actually, of when we build tools um, that particularly work in the, in the browser, that they are built to not be needed at some point in the future, right? Um, Brian LaRue, who worked on PhoneGap, he said from the start, you know, the ultimate aim of PhoneGap is to not be needed, to, to cease to exist. Um, I think jQuery reached that point, frankly. And the reason it reached that point is because it had such an influence on, on the standards. A um, huge success story. When, when I feel like when a library framework something ceases to be needed, that isn't, some, that isn't a, a sign of failure. You know, it's a sign of like, wow, that, that was a great library, great tool that served its purpose, and now we don't need it anymore. Isn't that great? Um, so, but the thing with Polyfill is you need to have a strategy for the future, for removal. It can be very tricky in an agency situation where you use a polyfill to ship a website, and you know, then your work is done, right? Your website ships. Um, how do you encode the information to future developers that, hey, you should probably check this bit of code every six months, 12 months, to see if it's still needed. You take it away if it's not needed. Um, and then over time, our code gets smaller and smaller. Um, but it's true that polyfills are kind of a tax on modern browsers, right? So they're there to kind of shore up generally older browsers that don't support feature. Um, that's why you want to remove them as, as soon as you can. There are ways of um, lazy loading polyphones, right? You check for support for the feature, and only if that feature isn't supported, load in the polyphone. That's the kind of central way to do it. I know again, Philip and Group have done a lot of great work in, in that area. But does that go kind of against the project? Because, but that's why they have to be temporary in nature. It has to be. It's kind of like you're making a proposal for like. And, and, and then there are some situations where I could polyphone something and it's like, nah, I don't know if it's not going to do it. Like, uh, there's a good example of a was um, media queries. Um, they worked as of Internet Explorer eight, nine, eight, eight. Yeah. So what do we we'll go back? What do we do about Internet Explorer 7? And one way is not we'll have a JavaScript polyfill for media queries. It's doable. Okay. Um, another situation and that solution is say like they don't get that layout. Maybe they get the mobile layout just not. I actually tend to go more for the second one. 
Um, but you have to make that decision on a case by case basis. Yeah. Yeah, polyfills are interesting. You're right. They're, they are a compromise. They are kind of like, okay, we'll spack a little bit of this for now. And, and, but but you, you have to have a strategy for the future to remove it. Um, otherwise, it's not a polyfill, it's, it's bloat. Yeah. Are we good? All right. Hey. Hey. Uh, I work for a design and development agency called Painting and we're over in uh, Seaport. Um, we're hiring pretty much for all disciplines, um, engineering, um, design, and even product management, if that's your thing. Um, if you are interested, um, cantina.co careers, or if I can give you my card. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, yeah, Stephen, I mentioned UI helped with MathWorks. What group for a senior UI engineer that will build out our UI framework for mobile desktop web development? Um, anything you can imagine to build up this framework if you want to dive deep in what Wait, so, okay, making sure it's not still full on me.